A little over 10 years ago, uh, the commercial airline industry commissioned an, an, uh, an analysis of uh, the risks in aviation. And they were surprised to find out that 38 percent of the risks in aviation uh, were on, existed on the surface of the airport even before taking off. So they made some significant changes in their re, uh, recertification training programs for the commercial airline pilots. One of those risks, of course, we know some of those risks would be something like an engine failure or a runway excursion, but we know that some of those risks were actually movement on the airport surface, what we call a runway incursion, getting on the runway without authorization. And what we found out uh, then is that we needed, uh, the FAA needed to commission some runway safety program offices to uh, conduct a, a further assessment and to start educating the flying community. So over the years, we found out that the number of runway incursions remain about the same, even though the number of operations in the national airspace system have gone down. We found out that uh, there are just about the same mistakes, the same nine or ten mistakes that pilots are making out on the surface of the field, and that these mistakes are unintentional. So we concluded that, you know, the mistakes that are made are what we call a short and the headset separator called the human error element. So the runway safety program offices are, are non-regulatory, and uh, our business is to conduct education, heighten awareness, to create a, a sense of the risk that exists on our nation's airports, uh, the risk that exists there when you go there, the risk that you bring as yourself when you come there. And so as our idea to suggest some changes in the system, such as lines and markings and signs on the nation's airport, but also maybe some new techniques that maybe pilots can in incorporate for themselves. So that's what we want to share with you today. And the best way to probably uh, set the tone for you is to show you an actual runway incursion that took place at San Francisco several years ago. Now, from what I can tell from listening to this as an experienced air traffic controller, this is a very sharp air traffic controller that's doing their job just like they should. They're in a rhythm. They know what their next four or five transmissions are going to be. And, they, and they're executing it very well. And uh, as is the case, you know, you formulated your next four or five transmissions and you know in what order they should be issued. So, and it, as is the case in this airport, as the most large airports, the air traffic controller that's issuing the runway crossing clearances is also the air traffic controller that's issuing the landing and takeoff clearances. All the aircraft are on the same frequency. That's for the purpose of heightening, heightening the situational awareness of the people that are operating out on that runway or near that runway. In this particular situation, the tower has an aircraft. Uh, they're, they're using all four runways for takeoff, and they're using uh, two runways for landing. So they got a Skywest 5741 that's cleared to land on runway 28 right, and they've put a Brickyard 4912 in position to hold runway 1 left. The rhythm is going very well, and uh, all of a sudden there's an unexpected event in this air traffic controller's strategy formulation. On November 298, Charlie Alpha gives them a call for entrance and clearance through the an inner core of Bravo airspace. In the instantaneous moment from the time the 298 Charlie Alpha unkeys his microphone to the next moment when the air traffic controller keys his microphone, he makes this probably cognitive decision in his mind that if I speak to 298 Charlie Alpha, right now I'm going to be 30 seconds behind where I'd like to be so let me go ahead and get a couple of these other transmissions out of the way first, and then I'll go to 298 Charlie Alpha. And that happens to be the cause of the mistake. And you'll hear the alarm that takes place in the control tower as the air traffic controllers who sense the runway incursion that's, that's taking place begin to shout to one another. So let me uh, activate this, uh, this for you, and uh, you'll see what we mean. That is 5741 San Francisco Tower, gosh, my turn 757 off to your left as well. So 747 just about to touch down, runway 28 left. And wind 30015, runway 28 right, clear to land. 28 right, clear to land, we have mobile aircraft this size, got 5741. Brickyard, 4912, runway uh, 1 left, position and hold, caution return. A 757 is departing the uh, parallel runway traffic is landing on 28. One last position, all very good, 49 Yeah, 893 heavy, cross runway 1 left, hold short runway 1 right. Cross runway 1 left, hold short 1 right, United 893 heavy. Uh, 
And United 893 Heavy, now cross runway 1 right and hold short runway 28 left. Cross 1 right, hold short 28 left, United 1850, contact Norcal departure, have a good flight. United 930 heavy, runway 28 left, position and hold. This is hold, runway 28 left, United 930 heavy. And United 930 heavy traffic, it's holding on runway 1 left, they'll be departing northbound. United 930 heavy, copy. So that's a, what we call a runway incursion, and that's what we would call a category A runway incursion. So there's a couple of questions I want to ask you. But first, let me uh, say this. You know, there were, as a minimum, there were five safety nets in this operation, five. Safety net number one was the air traffic controller who has the perspective, who's the one that's issuing the instructions, who is supposed to be analyzing the situation and making sure that safety uh, is uh, implemented above all things. That's the safety net that failed and caused this situation. Who were the other four safety nets? There was the pilot in command of SkyWest 5741, the pilot in command of Brickyard 4912, the flying pilot. And then there was the monitoring pilots in both aircraft, all four of those safety nets, and none of them materialized in that particular case. I mean, while there's a, yes, we know that the flying pilot on the, the SkyWest aircraft is, you know, trying to put that aircraft onto the center line of this 155, 150 foot wide piece of pavement. And that should be their primary duty as well. But the other pilot could be scanning. Brickyard 4912, I know I've sat as a passenger in aircraft uh, waiting for takeoff on runway one left and one right and seen those tight gaps coming in on 2A left and I said, wow, I hope the guys in the tower are paying attention so that they can squeeze me out of here between all of those. And they did it so successfully every, every time, except for a few, such as this one. So, I mean, none of, it's, the reason safety wind up usually materializing in the system is because everybody's doing their job well or one of those safety nets detects the mistake that's about to be made and intervenes and nothing takes place. But this time, none of them took place. So the risk was where? All over. The, the risk was everywhere and everybody has a role in trying to mitigate it, preventing it. But let me ask you, here's the question. How many times have you been the unexpected call to the air traffic controller? Uh, probably every time. Initial contact is the unexpected call. And you know what? More than 99% of the time, it works out just fine. The air traffic controller absorbs that information, introduces it into their decision-making process, and everything works out fine. But this just happened to be the one time when it just tripped up that air traffic controller. Did he anticipate that? No. Could we have ever anticipated that? No. We never know. Those things that we do on a routine basis that work so successfully over and over and over again, one time could be the short that causes the mistake. We just don't know. We are really strange, you know, we are, you are f fearfully and wonderfully made, as one poet says, but you have feet made of clay. You're going to make mistakes your whole life, and you can never anticipate that when that's going to take place. We, our traffic controllers, have prevented more runway incursions than we've ever caused. I can tell you that for sure. We have that advantage of being up, up above all of this uh, 
traffic that's moving on this field and you get you develop a feel for your traffic and you can tell you just get that innate sense when somebody's approaching a hold line or a runway that they were supposed to stop at that they had probably had their head down and they were about to go across and we'd reach out there and stop them we'd bark at them and they'd can catch them and you'd see them bounce on his nose strut and that's okay that's i mean that's how it works that's how safety is assured but when we cause them boy they can be buttes that's for sure well, look, here's, the, here's the, the customer ratio. Who causes the runway incursions? 62% of the runway incursions almost year after year after year is caused by a pilot deviation. And this number, this chart happens to be consistent in Europe and Canada and the United States. 19% are operational errors caused by an air traffic controller and another 19% are caused by vehicles and pedestrians. So as far as the Runway Safety Program Office goes and those of us that conduct these seminars, we know who our chief audience ought to be. It's the, it's the pilot community. We like to spend a lot of time out there face to face with and distributing literature that we have prepared to heighten your awareness. This happens to be a breakdown of the runway incursions that took place in one fiscal year from an October 1 to September 30th of uh, 2011. And you can see that uh, we had 954 runway incursions total. Operational errors 178. Pilot deviations, 593. Vehicle pedestrian deviations, 183. We also categorize them. A category A runway incursion, such as that as we just saw. Five of them that year, and four of them were caused by an air traffic controller, one by a vehicle. Category B, almost as serious, one of each, or one in uh, two different categories. Our, uh, our mission in the runway safety program is really not to eliminate runway incursions because then we would be doomed to failure because as we already established, runway incursions are caused by a human er error element and we can't eradicate that. What we hope to do is eliminate death and destruction. And the way we hope to do that is by constantly making one another aware of the risks that exist out there on the field and the risks that we bring to the field. Now, here happens to be a, uh, a calculation of uh, just a snapshot look of one quarter, a three month period of those pilot deviations that took place and who caused them. You see 78% of them were caused by a part 91 operator and 3% of those were caused by a military aircraft. And look at the bottom line here where, they, where most of them take place in daytime VMC, video, visual meteorological conditions. That's when the traffic is usually the heaviest, and that's when the mistakes are gonna take place. Now, once again, we get a picture here of who our biggest audience should be. It's the Part 91 operator, so that we can, because they're not necessarily required to conduct semi-annual or annual training. Once you get their license, some pilots never again get any instruction. What kind of mistakes do they make? Like I said, there were nine usual, the mistakes made by pilots usually fall in one of nine categories, but the top four categories always remain these four in one order or another. 28 times a pilot landed or took off without a clearance to do so. And you say, why would that happen? We don't know. And can we anticipate that? No, but it does take place. 25 times a pilot entered the runway or he crossed the runway without a clearance and hold short instructions were not required. In other words, I said taxi to runway 26 via alpha. I didn't have to tell you to hold short of runway 26. You know you're supposed to do that. A couple other times I said to a pilot, on, we, the air traffic controller said to a pilot, hold short of the runway and the pilot read back, Roger, hold short of the runway and then they went across anyway. So what would cause that? Forgetfulness or heads down time? See, these are the things we need to be mindful of the mistakes that we make. So what is it that causes us to make mistakes as human beings? So our jo my job as an analyst was to try to figure out, well, how does the human mind function? What causes us to make mistakes? And of course, we know that the, the brain has two different hemispheres and they function totally differently. Let me look, look at the bottom characteristic in both of these hemispheres. One says safety-minded, and the other hemisphere is risk-taking. I have to tell you this, an air traffic controller, a good air traffic controller, is a calculated risk-taker. That's one of the things that they do. See, there are so many variables that an air traffic controller has to take into consideration that they have no control over. I might be two Cherokee 235s landing or, uh, on the same runway within a few minutes of one, uh, one another, and yet one of them is going to turn off in 3,300 feet, the other one's going to take 
2,200 feet. We never know. And so can we get an aircraft in the gap to, and, and uh, for takeoff in between the two of them? You know, those are the variables that we deal with all the time. So an air traffic controller is a calculated risk taker, but not when they first start out. They're into the business of learning how to do the job safely, safely, safely. And then when they become proficient, they know when they can take a reasonable risk. And likewise, you too, as a pilot. There are many things now that you have to focus on while you're learning the job. And then as you've mastered the skill, you can start doing them out of rhythm, instinctively. And yet, so our brain is constantly managing these two hemispheres and it, using those different sides of the hemisphere. And most sometimes, one side is dominating over the other. And sometimes it's in the, in the incorrect side of the, of the brain. As an example, I'm driving down the uh, highway at, at 75 miles an hour uh, in a heavy, he fairly heavy traffic, and I see this plastic grocery bag wafting around the, uh, the highway in between all of these automobiles. Now, I have said to that self, to myself, based on the fact that uh, what I see, that that's probably an empty plastic grocery bag. So it's not going to hurt if it hits me. I need to take no evasive action. But wouldn't you know, as I approach that plastic grocery bag and the other vehicle blows it into my lane and it hits me in the windshield, I ducked. I told myself that it wasn't going to hurt, but why did I do that? Who was in control, my brain or my mind? So we never realize, and in you instrument pilots, you know that you had to learn to disregard the sensations of your, of your body and strictly read instruments. We never know sometimes, even though we have intended to do the right thing, that the right thing isn't executed. So, we are unique individuals, and as you read, watch all those programs on TV, those crime programs, everybody's talking about DNA, dioxyribose, nucleic acid. It's the very distinctive characteristic that makes you and I different. All of us have it, but all, every, each one of us is different. So in order to make the runway safety message a little fresh, because I know that you know, it's been around for so many years and people are getting are tiring of it, and don't, maybe not listening as closely as they ought to, I said, well, what can I do? Can I, can I couch the runway safety message in a new, a new category? And I called it the DNA of, run, of surface safety. And what did DNA stand for in this particular case? I call it deliberate navigation on the airport. That's the DNA of deliberate navigation on the airport. And what, would, what does the word deliberate mean? So I looked in the dictionary for a few synonyms. And uh, th these synonyms popped up and seemed to be effective. Cautious navigation on the airport. Studied navigation on the airport. Planned and advanced navigation on the airport. Now, when would you do some of these things? Some of these things need to be done while you're actually in the aircraft moving. Some of these things can be done in the ready room before you're moving. And some of these things ought to be done on a regular basis. So what kind of things do we need to be cautious about? What things should we plan in advance? Well, we ought to be cautious and plan in advance and understand signage marking and lighting, thorough communications, and the human factor. So I said, well, let's elaborate each one of these just a little bit. So we'll start with the human factor element. Deliberate, deliberately understanding, planning in advance, talking about it, being cautious, realizing that every time I come to the airport, I bring a risk and I'm exposed to a number of different risks. People who have DNA just like me, that sometimes can make a mistake. This is an ir there is an irrational belief among many that we can always perform at peak levels. People aren't being honest with themselves if they think that that's true that you can always perform at peak levels. That's just not, just not uh, true. So as a safety analyst, as a person who wants to be safe and teach others to be safe, what is it that I can say to you here today? What is it that you can do for yourself to help people to learn to be at their peak at key moments? That's basically what we'd like to do. How do we infuse a new safety consciousness in this particular area called surface operations? So that was my challenge uh, today. What we realize that, I mean, there's this uh, poor aeronautical decision making is probably the leading cause of a, of, a, of a runway incursion on somebody's part. And this happens to be a definition in the either pilot controller glossary or the aeronautical information manual. Aeronautical decision making is a systematic approach to the mental process used by pilots to constantly determine 
the best course of action in response to a given set of circumstances. Now, everybody makes decisions. What makes aeronautical decision-making so much different from other kind of decision-making? I, I borrow the phrase from the nationwide car insurance commercial where they said, life comes at you fast. Well, in aviation, life comes at you fast. And aeronautical decision-making sometimes requires split moment decision-making between safety and risk, which is going to dominate in this particular case. So, I'm, so from this s s sentence, I realized what the mental process is something that I had to give a thought to, and that's why I looked at the two different hemispheres and the way they operate differently. And so let's talk about poor aeronautical decision making. What would cause an operator to make a bad decision? And what can we do to mitigate that? We try to, what we need to do is try to avoid task saturation, which can happen even while you're moving on the surface of the airport. So, but I thought the best way to convey this to you was to, for this little, little game that we played. This is a, uh, a unison activity that we're going to perform with, with one another. We're going to read this chart out loud from the top left column down, and then the second column, then the third column, then the fourth column. We'll read it at this rate of speed. I want to keep you together in unison. I'll read along with you about the first three or four words, then I'm going to drop out and just let you read it to yourself. So on the count of three, let us begin. One, two, three. Red, blue, green, red. All right, very good. That's a very easy task. But now I'm going to make it a little more difficult. I'm going to put the words up one word at a time in the same order, one second in between words. I'm going to put the word up in color, and I want you to say the color that it's written in, not the word itself. Oh, so I think somebody's already sensing that this is going to be a challenge, that I'm going to make it a twist. You're right. So the very first word will be the word red. But if I put it up yellow, I want to hear you say yellow. Uh, but, you know, it's not always going to happen that way. By the time we get to the, the third word, somebody will have made a mistake. And those of you that can hear that person make the mistake, you'll laugh. So you need to laugh really quickly. Otherwise, you fall behind and then you make the next mistake and they're laughing at you. Also, you know, in a rhythmic activity such as this, you know, when you're watching a concert on TV and the cameramen are all focusing on the performers, but every once in a while, they turn the camera around and they focus on the, uh, the, the folks in the auditorium. And every, they always find that one person that has no rhythm, all right? So everybody, all 999 people are clapping on a downbeat with a drummer, except for that one person that has no rhythm. And so you're going to hear, you know, most of the folks around you say red in a microsecond later, red, blue, blue, green, green, don't be that person. Just jump right out there, say it as fast as you can, because it's going to be a fast moving activity, and it will create tension. Experience the, the tension, and we'll describe it and sh explain to you why, how poor aeronautical decision making can take place. Now, we're only going to use these four colors, by the way, red, blue, green, yellow. Um, Projection may sometimes change it a little bit. You know, it's no magenta for those of you who are ground school masters, all right? It's pink. It's not pink and it's not magenta. There's no purple. So you know what you're going to say, correct? You're going to say the color, one second in between words. Are you ready? And begin. Well, for those of you that may be watching in the privacy of your office, I'm sure you didn't make any mistakes, but for those uh, that were in the audience, well, we had a lot of them. And that's what we expected. At least we were hoping that that would happen so that we could validate the point that we were going to make here. So let me ask you, was it difficult? Yeah. yeah. It came at you very fast, right? And here's the challenge. Well, let me, let me put it this way. If I had given you five seconds in between words, you think you would have been a little bit more successful? Aha, uh -huh. yeah, sure. 
a little more time to think about it. But here's the challenge. The simplest thing that we do in this task was to read. That's what we coached you into doing with the first, first activity. I ask you to perform a slightly more difficult cognitive activity to interpret a color. And in the time frame that you had available to do that, it was very difficult for you to make the leap up here and to say the color and disregard the word. Now, here's the example. Air traffic controller, we introduce, we have a capacity of introducing a great amount of stress into your cockpit that wouldn't otherwise be there, would we? Because from the moment I unkey my microphone and making a transmission from you, I'm expecting you to what? Instantly key the microphone, read it back, and the moment that you unkey the microphone after having read it back, I'm expecting you to what? Do it, right? Sure. All right, so here you are. You're sitting at the middle of a runway waiting to go across, right? And now we are traffic controllers. We give the highest priority to the aircraft that want to land and take off. Our job is to pound the pavement with arrivals and departures, get maximum occupancy right out of this, out of this runway. And so if all you want to do is get a go, go across, we usually get the lowest priority. And I'm sure pilots have sat there for four, five minutes and you know, said to themselves, golly, ground, I could have pushed this aircraft across a runway in that gap, and you're just sitting there and forgot all about me. Well, well maybe so. Sometimes that we could forget. But we, our job is to uh, use that runway well. And now, so here you are, you're in a coma, right? Waiting to go across, and now on unexpected, out of the blue, air traffic control says, November 18 Echo, without delay, cross runway 26 left. 18 Echo, Roger, crossing 26 left. Did you look at both ends of the runway and the celestial dome, high and low, to make sure nobody was on short final? No. See, that's poor aeronautical decision making. Because ultimately, you have to make the call. Can I do that? Can my aircraft do that? Does the situation around me permit me to do that? And if the answer to any one of those questions was no, then you're supposed to say unable ground, unable tower, unable approach, unable center. I got to come up with an alternate suggestion. That's law. You're pilot in command. You got to make the decision. But I can push you into making bad decisions. So if you're focusing and majoring on the major and not majoring on a minor, and realizing that I am now in this risk called the, run, the airport surface, and there is a whole bunch of other people that could be making mistakes besides me, and I better watch out for all of them. See, you can make a bad decision. So we need to avoid task saturation, focus on the environment that you're in at that particular moment, and let's not make a mistake and cross the runway that we weren't supposed to. That's one of the human factors. Now, there are so many things that we have mastered as individuals, all right? And we don't have to think about doing them. We can do them with muscle memory, even as a pilot, even as an air traffic controller, functioning by rhythm. And so we're quickly distracted by something else. And could be, you know, some people said, you people that live in the Western Hemisphere, you don't have the ability to focus on anything for any great length of time. There's too many sensory, too many things appealing to your senses out there that you never think about anything for any great length of time. In fact, one person says, I mean, you are, so, you are so erratic in your thought process, you never even focus on the present when the present is pleasant. You're always thinking about the future. And in one respect, that's okay as a pilot, right? You're supposed to stay ahead of your aircraft, but we need to focus on the moment. And so one of those things that we can be caught up in is inattention. We're not paying attention to the present environment that we are in and looking out the window when you're moving and one of those things that we need to do for ourselves to make sure that we compensate for that risk is maintain a sterile cockpit so that we don't make a mistake and do something instinctively. Our aircraft is moving without us actually moving with it. We're thinking of something else. Uh, it just happens from that. It's a sterile cockpit. According to advisory circular for the commercial aviator, that means no unnecessary chatter from the time you push off the gate until you reach 10,000 MSL and no unnecessary chatter from the time you leave TMSL and reach the gate. For the General Aviation Part 91 small aircraft operator, the same philosophy ought to apply. Sterile cockpit until you reach traffic pattern altitude or you exit Delta airspace or Charlie airspace, whatever it happens to be. That's one of those things we can do for ourselves to compensate for the natural tendency of called inattention, which can happen at any time unexpected. So we need to be mindful of that. Preoccupation. Remember when the, the L-1011 descended into the Everglades west of Miami several decades ago? Everybody 
probably knows a story that's been in aviation for any length of time, an unsafe gear indication. And so they were preoccupied with either looking through the, under the floorboards to find out if a certain gears were lined up or f finding a light bulb to replace the indication. And somebody accidentally disengaged altitude hold and the aircraft slowly descended into terrain. They were definitely preoccupied with a detail that needed to be taken care of, but nonetheless scanning should continue Non-stop scanning. So as you're moving on the surface of the airport, in preparation for flight or the discussion that's taking place, if you're not maintaining a sterile cockpit or other things are taking place that may affect you, we still need to be scanning, especially when you're going across the runway. Three times in my career, a pilot landed on the opposite end of the runway in a nighttime operation. Will all the aircraft on final for, this, for, the, for landing this way and taking off this way, but somebody landed this way? And the reason why they did it is they had, an uns they had a, a total electrical failure, so the transponder wasn't working, didn't show up on my screen. The lights weren't working, so I couldn't see, against, see them against the celestial dome, and the radio wasn't working. They couldn't tell me that that's what they needed to do. So we need to be scanning all the time when we go across the runway. And I know, you know, the motto is trust ATC and verify absolutely everything that they do. If I tell you to line up and wait, make sure the runway is clear. Make sure there's nobody on final. If it's a clear for takeoff, make sure there's nobody approaching the runway and go about to cross. Those are the things you need to do, non-stop scanning. Loss of situational awareness, you know what that is, absorbing information all around you through using your five senses and painting a picture. In fact, it could be a quarter mile visibility in fog and you can sort of tell what's going on around you if you're listening, absorbing the information that's available to you through sight and sound. Who do you think, though, is the most important person to listen to? I submit to you that the most important person that must be listened to is yourself, because it's more likely that we can speak habitually. I mean, you've probably pride yourself as an experienced aviator to be able to read back what I say to you as quickly as I can say it, because we do speak very rapidly, such as I am speaking right now. And you have tried to master reading back my instructions as quickly as I can say them, because you will not be stumped by any air traffic controller, right? But now, how many times have you said, after you've hung up the microphone or unkeyed, and a moment later said, uh, what are we really supposed to do here? How many, see, how many, when we showed that one example, we said the pilot acknowledged hold short instructions, but they went across the runway anyway. Wow, why did they do that? Was the head down, or had they just forgotten? We don't know. We don't know. So, all right, perspective memory. Perspective memory means you're intending to do something in the future, but you can't do it right now. You've thought about it, but you're going to do it a little bit later. So that's just, we call that forgetfulness. And what can we do to compensate for forgetfulness? Write down your taxi instructions. Damn, nah, we don't have to worry about it. Disorientation, can you get lost? Are some airports challenging, more challenging to taxi on than others? What can you do to help you? Use the airport diagram. And we put them back in the green book, in the back of the green book, the AFD. They're on so many different websites that you can get them. There's no reason why we shouldn't have one. Now, all right, quickly, through communication. We can communicate instinctively. We can communicate thoughtfully. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on air traffic control phraseology, but look at these critical elements of communication. These are the three distinctive elements of co effective communication. Which one of these is missing in the environment between me, the air traffic controller, and you, the pilot? Facial, right. And how much, of a, how much does it make up in this communication factor? More than half. Now, I assure you that there's many ways that I can convey to you what my face is looking like when I say certain things to you, can't you? You can probably see the, hear, see the scowl on my face just by the tone of my voice. But nonetheless, I mean, we're not going to spend too much time talking about that. I'm not going to make an excuse for occasional air traffic control belligerents, but nonetheless, we need to realize, well, this is missing, so we need to definitely focus on the other points, the vocal, the verbs that are used, and what we're saying to one another. And the last thing, signage, marking, and lighting. Hmm. Deliberate, cautious, planned in advance. Now, what are we going to do about this? What are we going to talk about this? Which one of these signs is upside down? Uh, see, wait, did I catch you by surprise? Sure, you weren't anticipating it. And so therefore, it's not likely that you may get the right answer. And I think that's why I think signage and marking tests that we throw out at you sometime on written pieces of paper are unfair, because they're out of context. But when they show up in context, we need to realize what they mean. 
And so we've tried a variety of things to try to simplify it out there to make it clear to you what, where you are. But how many lines does it take to prevent a runway incursion? Runways are outlined in white, everything else is yellow. We've made enhanced taxiway center lines, we've broadened the hold line. This 150 foot extra pieces of paint out there just before you reach the hold line. Enhanced taxiway center line. But at 25 knots, you're gonna cross over that in about three and a half seconds. So you only got three and a half seconds of advance warning that you're coming up on the hold line. But that's what it looks like. And then of course, it takes you up to this line, which is now much bigger than it ever was before. So we had a whole lot of NASA reports that the pilot said, I couldn't, I didn't see your stinking hold line cause it was faded yellow paint on faded asphalt. So the airport's division changed the regulations and they said, we're gonna make those yellow lines 12 inches wide rather than six and we're gonna put black paint down under the yellow so that it's, we have an established permanent contrast and we're gonna use beaded paint. But you know what, people are still blowing through that line unexpectedly. Has it accomplished its task? I don't know. Has it prevented runway incursions? I hope so in some cases, but it hasn't eliminated all of them. But let me ask you this, and don't answer, because it'll be embarrassing. Which side of this line is the runway? Usually at a flight instructor refresher clinic, and I ask that question out loud, I get hands pointing in both directions, and a few moments later, somebody, one angle, retracts their hand, because we caught them by surprise. So on the right side of this line, you can remain a intact whole aircraft. On the segmented side of this line, you could become a segmented aircraft, because that's where the runway is, or even worse. If you're out there when you're not supposed to be, either because I made a mistake and put you out there when, you sh when I shouldn't have, or you went out there when you shouldn't have because I had somebody on short final. And look, look, here's surface contamination that you got to deal with from time to time. Is it hard to see the hold line? Can you see the hold line? Well, let me tell you this. If you're looking for a hold line because you made it your highest priority, concluding for yourself, there is a runway in between where I am and where I want to go. I got to find it. You might see the extra glare that's growing across the taxiway, and you'll say to yourself, well, that might be the paint that of that whole line. And I wonder if there's a rectangular sign adjacent to it on the left-hand side. And if you're looking for it, you might see it. But if you're not, you can blow right through this. It's a challenge. It definitely is. Listen, what we know for sure is well-trained and highly motivated people will make mistakes. And we just need to be mindful of that. And what we suspect is that poorly trained, unmotivated people will probably make more mistakes. So we need to bring our A game. We need to try to be at peak in those critical moments out there and uh, realize that you may be doing everything right, but somebody else is doing something wrong because they're not quite at their A game level. The rules were made for one particular purpose. If everybody does them, if everybody performs this way, a safe outcome can be predicted with greater certainty if we all do it right. And now you know what? We know that runway incursions take place at airports where there are no control towers, but there's nobody there to report them. And so we know that some people are perhaps more inclined to do unordinary things uh, at those environments too. So there's, there's a risk that exists there also. But at the airports with control towers, 550 some airports with control towers. We have almost a thousand runway incursions a year, even though the number of operations are coming down. So what we want to do is just, we want to teach compliance. We want to practice compliance. And, and my, from you, this is my life motto, but what is the order of things? In life, in so many areas of life, there is an order of things. And as long as we can identify the order of things and then live in harmony with them. We're really a life, living a life of peace and accuracy in, uh, with our fellow man and with our fellow aviator. And so for your sake, um, find out what that is. Realize what, you, frankly, admit to yourself where your frailties are, where your personal techniques are that may need some tweaking. And then uh, resolve to perfect it, realizing that you are a human being Fearfully and wonderfully made, but prone to make mistakes from time to time. And that uh, be mindful of the other folk too, that are in the same boat as you are.